I'm Mark Crumpton. You're watching Bloomberg Technology. Let's check first word news. President Obama campaigned for Hillary Clinton today at a get out the vote rally in Miami. The president urged her supporters to take advantage of the opportunity to vote before Election Day. All the progress we made goes out the window if we don't win this election. So we've got to work our hearts out this week. We got to work like our future depends on it because it actually depends on it. Also on the campaign trail in Florida, Donald Trump hit back. This guy ought to be back in the office working. He's not going to be there very long, thank goodness. But he ought to be back in the office working. In South Carolina, friends and family of Walter Scott, an unarmed black man shot and killed by a white police officer last year, testified today after opening statements in the former officer's murder trial. Cell phone video footage showed Michael Slager shooting Scott in the back as he ran from his car after being pulled over. Slager faces 30 years to life if convicted. Syrian troops will allow rebels to leave Aleppo during a temporary break in fighting declared by Moscow. That's according to the Russian military, which says two corridors near the borders will stay open Friday during what's called a humanitarian pause. In New York, I'm Mark Crumpton. Bloomberg Technology is next. I'm Brad Stone, in for Emily Chang. This is Bloomberg Technology. Coming up, GoPro shares nosedive over 20% after a disappointing third quarter snapshot. We'll break down the numbers. Plus, escalating cyber threats with the US elections just days away. We'll catch up with CrowdStrike CEO. And Fox hits a home run with the most watched World Series game in 25 years, but the NFL suddenly appears to have a ratings problem. First to our lead, GoPro shares plummeting as much as 25% in extended trading. It's become the latest hardware maker to say it expects a lousy holiday season. The company lowered its sales forecast for the fourth quarter to between 600 and 650 million, missing analyst estimates. GoPro also missed the estimates for third quarter sales, reporting over 240 million in revenues, down 40% year over year. Net loss was 104 million, down more than 650% from the same quarter last year. CEO Nick Woodman told investors on the earnings call that the production issues were to blame for the weak results. As a consequence of our compromised production ramp, we were unable to fully restock channels which had been cleared of legacy products during the third quarter. And furthermore, we anticipate difficulty catching up to meet forecasted demand during the fourth quarter. Joining us now for more is Jitendra Worrell of Bloomberg Intelligence and from New York, Bloomberg Technology reporter Selena Wang. Jitendra, you, GoPro bro? stock plummeting like a drone that hits a power line. After what? thinking that it's going to take off first. <laughs> After thinking that it would scale to the skies. What is going, what is ailing GoPro? So now, now they're blaming production issues for not being able to meet targets. But, you know, this is really a bad execution story over here because they didn't have a product last year. Uh, there was no refresh. Uh, so there was uh, quite a lot of time uh, that happened. They finally fixed the ease of use issues that people had. Finally, there were new products and drones, and and you take that and marry that with production issues. I mean, it's just not, it just raises a lot of concerns about the execution risks over here. Selena, getting into the drone business was supposed to provide a next act for GoPro. What, you know, when you look at this balance sheet and the way that Wall Street has reacted to the third quarter results, is there, are there any bright spots for GoPro? I mean, Woodman was very coy about saying anything about the karma. What he did say was that in the fourth quarter, it would be a pretty small proportion of the revenue compared to the new camera. I really... the biggest thing they have going for them really is their brand at this point. If you look at the DJI, they've been in this business for 10 years. They have excellent features. They have more features, in fact, better sensors, better technology. The price point is quite similar. So if you're looking at it pure, from a pure tech standpoint, really DJI wins out in this area. There's also tons of startups getting into this business as well with lower end machines. So really the brand is the only bright spot for GoPro because more people in the U.S. know about GoPro. Right, DJI being the Shenzhen-based drone maker, uh, you know, has been in the business for a number of years. Was GoPro surprised by DJI's competitive response? 
to its drone plans, right? It, it introduced its own drone very soon after GoPro made its announcement. Well, this is GoPro's first drone versus DJI's drone king. So that was kind of expected. I mean, what's interesting is like the supply chain issues across the drone industry seems to be pretty much similar. I mean, even DJI is having some shipping issues. Now, what GoPro is saying that they're expecting double digit growth next year. Now, expectations are more than 20%. We don't know what that double digit really means. And if, even looking at the execution that they have shown so far, we're just concerned about like, are they able to pull off uh, the opportunity that they have in, in drones. And when you say supply chain issues, what does that mean? Like in DJI, production and issues can, and can you order issues. one of these new drones for this yeah. holiday season? Uh, you can, but you can't get it. You can order it, uh, and they will take your money, but they will does probably it, not Does get it get to. here for Christmas? Um, maybe. It, now they're saying December for DJI. Karma is saying November 28th, uh, but um, but beyond beyond that, you know, we were really hoping that they could leverage their brand, the massive brand that they have in terms of upselling to the 10 million plus customers. And the interest level was pretty high as well, you know, when we did our surveys. But if these guys are not able to meet the demand or not able to resolve these production issues, I mean, uh, that's uh, that's raising a lot of execution risks for the company. Selena, you wrote a story that uh, highlighted problems problems at another hardware maker, Fitbit, and of course we've drawn some connections here between these two companies and their poor performance. Are they related? Is there a kind of secular problem among all these hardware companies as we head in to the very important holiday season? There is a fascinating correlation between the two companies. I mean, they're both young companies that have recently IPO'd. Uh, they were IPO to much fanfare and they really just haven't lived up to their expectations. I think taking a step back and looking at these companies, though their actual products have little overlap, um, they both are in markets that aren't really quite proven yet. And I think the question that investors are asking is, can you turn a sort of fad into a long-term sustainable company? I mean, you look at GoPro, they make these little tiny rugged cameras and now they're trying to do drones. But the question everyone is asking is, does everybody need a tiny little camera in addition to their smartphone? Uh, you heard analysts ask on the call, uh, you know, Nick, what actually is the grand vision for this company? You've talked about making it a media company, about really increasing the addressable market. And he said, we see ourselves at the epicenter of uh, social and capturing images and sharing that. But there are so many companies at the epicenter of that. And it's so interesting. I mean, you look at Snap. They are now calling themselves a camera company. And they're probably going to make it even easier than GoPro is to take your images and directly upload them to the web and share it. Well, Selena, what is what is the next move for GoPro? I mean, earlier this year, they hired a, a very well-known designer from Apple. And I actually, I remember stock bounced on the day that they made that, that hire. Have we seen the results? of that and what do you think is their next act if there is one? I do think that they've solved a lot of the core problems with the product and the software. I mean, just a year ago, it was really hard to operate the camera. They had all these buttons. Consumers were complaining about how difficult it was to use and you had to stitch together a different editing software and it took a very, very long time for all of that to work together and share it. And now they've, uh, they made some acquisitions, they really invested in their hardware and software, so it is much easier to do. Their next move is making that even easier, even more shareable, trying to expand their sales in drones and this whole media content strategy I think is way, way down the line. Okay, Jitendra, last word. What, what, what should Nick's next move be? Focus on the execution. I mean, uh, this it's not acceptable, especially when you had such a big gap in terms of your product cycle. So taking the uh, right steps that they have done with respect to ease of use and, and leveraging the brand and trying to cross-sell, they have the opportunity, but you got to move very, very quickly or you're going to lose it. Okay, Bloomberg Technology reporter Selena Wang in New York and Jitendra Waral of Bloomberg Intelligence. Thank you both. Thank you, Brad. Still to come, the cybersecurity firm that first pointed the finger at Russia for the DNC hack is back. CrowdStrike CEO tells us about the top cyber threats to watch on Election Day. This is Bloomberg. One stock we're watching, Symantec shares are lower after forecasting earnings for the current quarter that will miss some analyst estimates. Symantec is the biggest maker of cybersecurity software and it's, it has struggled as the PC market declines and hackers develop more sophisticated techniques. 
On the other hand, rival FireEye shares are surging after saying its full year losses won't be as bad as predicted in August. The company had forecast a loss as, as much as $1.32 per share for 2016. It now says that its loss won't be more than $1.16 a share. Staying with cybersecurity, it's become a top talking point on the campaign trail thanks to an extraordinary series of events from Hillary Clinton's use of private email servers to moments like this one. Russia, if you're listening, I hope you're able to find the 30,000 emails that are missing. I think you will probably be rewarded mightily by our press. We also had the DNC hack this year and countless claims by Donald Trump that this election is rigged. CrowdStrike was the cybersecurity firm that first identified Russian involvement in the DNC hack. CEO George Kurtz joins us now for more on the unprecedented role of cyber threats this election. Thank you for joining us Great again, George. Here. I don't know if, there's, if there was more anxiety last night in the 10th inning of the World Series or now for this next week leading up to the election. What do you expect? Do you think... There will be smooth sailing over the next uh, six days as we head towards next Tuesday? Well, if the pass is any indication, it seems like there's always a new leak or some new event that happens almost on a daily basis, particularly in the cybersecurity world, whether it's emails found on somebody's servers or it's new emails that are leaked given uh, some of the breaches that took place. So I think it's going to be an interesting run up to the election. So David Sanger had a nice piece in the New York Times kind of outlining the possibilities over the next week. And one of your colleagues at CrowdStrike had a quote in the piece saying that he thought the ultimate intent of hackers was not to change the results, that's obviously far-fetched, mm -hmm. but to discredit the election, to throw a kind of question mark over the results. Do you think that's right, and what are the possible ways they might do that? Well, I think in general, when you look at what transpired and some of the work that we've done, and, and certainly some of the work that the government has done to come out and, and, and uh, name Russia as one of the actors involved here, I think that's part of the, the mode of operation that's been done in the past. Cyber is, is just a new medium, but in the past, whether it was in the, you know, uh, 50s, 60s, 70s, it, it was a similar uh, methodology in terms of trying to introduce chaos where you can. And this is just another way to do that through cyber. So I think um, if we look at the election and we look at what's been done so far, I mean, you know, people are asking the question, is it Russia, is it not Russia, what's going to happen, what does it all mean, are the elections going to be hacked or, or not? And it's a talking point, I think, that helps to sometimes destabilize what's going on. Has Russia done this in the past? I know there was some suggestion that maybe they got involved in the Ukrainian elections with similar tactics. Talk a little bit about what happened in those previous uh, elections and, and whether that might give us a, a guidepost for this next week. Well, they're a very capable adversary, uh, certainly very good on the cyber side, which is one of the things you know we see all the time when we're investigating these sort of activities. And, um, you know, their, their method of operation at, hasn't necessarily change the, the medium has changed right so they're now more focused on cyber because they don't have to necessarily leave the comfort of their chair um, but you know when you look at the the methods uh, whether it's a piece of malware or whether it's a phishing attack uh, it's all available uh, on the internet and they're taking advantage of all that data is it simple enough to say that they are uh, trying to support the candidacy of Donald Trump, or are they basically trying to throw the U.S. election system itself into chaos? Well, like most governments, they collect lots of information. If you look at all the emails, whether they're classified or not classified, uh, things like collecting um, what's happening behind the scenes and understanding where the wind is blowing is very important for them. So that collection mechanism is not necessarily unique. It's what you do with that data. And I think what has been very unique in this case is the fact that it now has ended up on the Internet and people are free to look at it, and does that influence the election one way or another? We'll see. So every American voter that uh, turns out next Tuesday and goes to an electronic voting machine, and now that's a, a vast majority of voters, mm -hmm. is going to wonder in the back of their minds, is this voting machine safe? Is that unequivocally a yes right now, or is there still some question in your mind? Well, I think the question is, is the voting process safe? And if you look at what happens in the voting process, a lot of it is still manual. There's certainly electronic voting systems, and those are always susceptible to attack. I think there's a lot of eyes that have been put on this. But in general, it's so manual that, um, you know, statistically, the voting system is not necessarily going to be impacted uh, by hack and change the election. How about voter rolls? Is there some possibility that a voter turns out and they're not registered the voter, they turned up at the wrong place because of some kind of tinkering from, uh, from outside the country? 
Well, I think that's always a possibility. If you look at how easy it is to actually break into these systems and, and sort of uh, the lack of security that exists in the, in the environment today from, from legacy technology, it's very easy to get in. And could they manipulate those, those sort of uh, roles? Absolutely. Um, will it happen? Will it make a meaningful difference? Don't know. So everyone in the political process, and maybe even in the business world, has had to have been sort of slightly traumatized by this election cycle. I mean, not only Hillary Clinton's emails made public, uh, but you've got companies like Salesforce, whose internal communications were made public as part of uh, Colin Powell, one of its board members, uh, hack. What, what have the lessons been of this election cycle? Do you think that we've learned something that maybe future candidates or even companies today can, can take a lesson from? Yeah, I think you need to look at whether it's a candidate or whether it's a company, uh, they all face similar threats. And what's important to realize is number one is most organizations have been compromised in some fashion, right? So it's important to understand if there is a compromise in the environment. And number two is the technologies uh, that are put in place to try to defend against these attacks are, are just inadequate, right? So it's very easy to get in, whether it's a spearfish, whether it's malware running, uh, the current technologies can't keep up. And then having the ability to actually find them very quickly before that data is stolen uh, is going to be very important going forward. So you can look at what happened here and so it's easy to get in with a spearfish. Malware is not being detected by legacy antivirus technology. And then all the data is being dumped because it's not encrypted. There's many lessons learned that things companies can a do. Spearfish is a spearfish is basically user error. It's somebody clicking on a link that they shouldn't have clicked on. Well, they clicked on a link and they either gave out their password, username and password, or they clicked on a link and it downloaded some malware, which wasn't uh, captured by their, their legacy antivirus technology. Do you think all of these traumas, going back to the Sony hack, have undermined the use of email? Like are, are future candidates, are CEOs thinking twice before they hit, hit the click, the send button on an email? Yeah, I would imagine that there's a lot of uh, venture capitalists here in, in San Francisco in the Valley that are gonna be investing in email security companies that focus on really locking down those email servers more than what's been done in the past. Okay, last question. Next Tuesday, the Department of Homeland Security, what, what is different about the precautions they are taking for next Tuesday, or, or even how they're spending the day than it was four years ago? Well, I think if you look at the election and you understand how it's been influenced by the cyber attacks in the past, I think there's certainly a heightened visibility into what's next, what can come. Just think about the denial of service attack that took place a couple of weeks ago, right? Um, something like that. Could it take out, you know, again, social media? Could it take out uh, systems that are designed to collect some of this information? Just think about the impact on social media if it was down during the election day. Do you think we'll see a denial of service attack next week? I hope not. I hope not. Okay. Thank you, George Kurtz, CrowdStrike CEO. Thank you. Coming up, investors' concerns over Facebook's ad load sent shares tumbling. So where are other opportunities for revenue growth? That's next. This is Bloomberg. when you're in the middle of a crisis situation. It's really all about enabling people. Technology needs to serve everyone. But at the end of the day, it's all about emotional decision. I think there's huge innovation left in music. The hallmark of a truly great leader is that great is never great enough. I have the great comfort of knowing what I did and feeling good about myself and everything else doesn't really matter. Facebook shares plummeting over 5.5% on Thursday. Executives suggest the company probably won't be able to keep up its explosive pace of growth much longer. In the earnings call, CFO David Weiner told investors that the company won't keep increasing the percentage of ads that Facebook users see in their news feed. Michael Wolf spoke about the ad load decline on Bloomberg Markets with Von Quinn and Mark Barton. I mean, I think that they're hitting the upper limits of how many ads they can, they can show you. And I think also a lot of their growth this year has come from political advertising, which of course won't be there next year. And so they now are in a, in a position where they can't, they can't get more revenue out of the internet. And historically, a lot of the revenue growth has been taking away money out of smaller websites. So going forward, yes, they'll grow fast, but it's not likely it's going to be anything unless they invent new parts of their business. And I think that's likely to come from their messaging, Facebook Messenger and, and also WhatsApp, which are, are massive. So 
So why are people so preoccupied about the advertising revenue? They have been making bold on acquisitions. They have been acquiring anything that moves that's of any you know, potential interest yeah. to them. So why shouldn't growth come from there in the future? Uh, because that's the only place that they're that they're getting advertise they're getting revenue and the, the other deals that they've done WhatsApp really isn't delivering any revenue. I mean, the average revenue per user is zero, and uh, and the the VR business is also not there, there's not there's revenue way off in the future. So this is basically they're like Google. They are an advertising based company and they're going to grow on the extent to which money moves to the internet and the extent to which they can capture it. Michael, is this the picture for the whole industry? I mean, it's going to be harder for the ad-supported content companies, but the likes of Google, the likes of Facebook, the likes of Apple and Amazon and Microsoft, they'll benefit. Uh, each of those companies is in a different position. So uh, in the case of both Facebook and Google, they're essentially an oligopoly. They're controlling over half of all digital advertising. Then when you look at others, there's always an upstart. There's somebody that comes out of nowhere. There's a hit from nowhere. And so here we have Snapchat, which is capturing a lot of time and attention, especially from millennials. And they're coming on board this holiday season, and they're going to have a lot of new advertising products that they can offer advertisers. Amazon really is in the, in the e-commerce business, and they're nowhere close to this. And Apple competes with Facebook primarily now now on its messaging product. Down around 6% in the last two days. I mean, is this repricing a good thing for Facebook? Is it coming more into line with what it should be valued at? Or what do you make of its valuation? Trading right now at uh, 46 times PE and uh, three, what, uh, 29 times the estimated PE. Right. We, we have to recognize that Facebook is a control company. And Mark Zuckerberg controls the company. And so he's going to be less worried about what the near-term stock price is versus his ability to grow long-term. The main reason he'll be worried about the stock price is their ability to give options to their employees and have increasing growth from the earnings of their employees versus what, what happens for shareholders. That was Activate CEO Michael Wolf. In this edition of Out of This World, Inmarsat is looking for a new supplier to launch its in-flight Wi-Fi satellite into orbit. That's because it had bought two launches from SpaceX, but after a September 1st explosion destroyed SpaceX's rocket and the satellite it was carrying, Inmarsat's order got delayed. Inmarsat is considering giving a contract to United Launch Alliance, Ariane Space, or International Launch Services. All of those companies are planning launches sooner than SpaceX, and SpaceX will be operational again. Inmarsat would use its launch contract with SpaceX at a later date. Coming up, the Chicago Cubs break a 108-year curse with a historic World Series win. Why this also was a winning night for Fox, next. And if you like Bloomberg News, check us out on the radio. You can now listen on the Bloomberg Radio app, Bloomberg.com, and in the U.S. on Sirius XM. This is Bloomberg. I'm Mark Crumpton. You're watching Bloomberg Technology. Let's check first word news. Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump are dispatching reinforcements to the campaign trail in Michigan, a blue state that may suddenly be in play. Polls show Clinton with a one point lead there. Former President Bill Clinton met with black ministers in Detroit, where voters have long been crucial to the Democrat success. Clinton will be there on Friday. Mike Pence and Ted Cruz will campaign for Trump in Michigan today. Chua Soon Sil, a longtime friend of South Korean President Park Gun hye has been arrested following allegations of influence peddling. Chua was taken into custody as many opposition lawmakers demanded that President Park also be investigated. Park issued a public apology last week. Nearly a year after the terror attacks in France, tourism still isn't back to normal. According to government figures, foreign visitors who arrived by air dropped 8 percent between January and October. Prime Minister Manuel Valls has scheduled a meeting next week to look into ways to better promote tourism. A group working to reduce the escalating price tag for hosting the 2020 Olympics in Japan says all options are now on the table. The panel said the cost could exceed $30 billion, four times the initial estimate. The decision is expected at the end of the month. I'm Mark Crumpton. This is Bloomberg. It's just after 6.30 p.m. Thursday here in New York, 9.30 Friday morning in Sydney. My colleague Paul Allen has a look at
look at the markets. Paul, good morning. Good morning, Mark. Let's uh, take a look at New Zealand up and running on the last day of the week and uh, not looking so good, uh, off very slightly, about a tenth of 1% right now. We're also expecting declines on the ASX at the open and a little under 30 minutes of about half a percent. Uh, Nikkei futures, meanwhile, uh, looking pretty flat at the moment. Uh, some more earnings out of Japan today. We have uh, Mitsubishi Corp, uh, Suzuki and Takata, the airbag maker, to name a few. And it might be worth keeping an eye on the Australian dollar to today as well. It has been steadily creeping up over the past few months. A couple of interesting points out today. We have the Reserve Bank of Australia releasing its quarterly statement of monetary policy. Uh, that's going to contain a few updated outlooks for growth and inflation. And we'll also have retail sales out for September. That's expected to hold steady at a 0.4% increase. Over in Singapore, uh, be worth watching Singapore Airlines today. After the close yesterday, Singapore Air an announcing a 70% slump in second quarter profits to $46.8 million on excess capacity and aggressive pricing weighing on that result. I'm Paul Allen in Sydney. More from Bloomberg Technology next. This is Bloomberg Technology. I'm Brad Stone in for Emily Chang. The Chicago Cubs had an epic win in Game 7 of the World Series, marking an end to their 108-year drought. But the team wasn't the only one to hit a home run. Fox Sports says Chicago's 8-7 win over the Cleveland Indians, my hometown team, was the most watched World Series game in 25 years since the Braves-Twins matchup of 1991, giving the U.S. Major League Baseball a much-needed ratings boost. And it turns out baseball isn't the only major sport that's been needing a pick-me-up. For more on this, I want to bring in longtime media exec and share through President Patrick Keene, along with Bloomberg's Sarah Fryer. Thank you guys for joining us. Patrick, I am a little bit depressed today, uh, given that my Cleveland Indians were defeated in an epic game. But it's great for Chicago, and it's great for Major League Baseball, right? Why, why was this ratings turnout such a big win for the league? Yeah, I mean, it was an absolutely huge one for the league. If you look at this, this was the highest rating in 25 years for Major League Baseball. Let me repeat, 25 years. So to have 40 million viewers nationally watching the game is pretty extraordinary. And I know we'll get into it in a little bit, but this is just bad news for 280 Park Avenue. I think it's another example of the National Football League, and that's their headquarters, being really hit by yet another league that's starting to grow share. And, and, and let's talk about that. It's the cover of this week's Business Week, a great piece by writer Felix Gillette talking about the problems at the NFL. Do you think it's a fair juxtaposition? I mean, Game 7 of the World Series versus, you know, the week-to-week the week -week, uh, performance of the NFL in an election season? I think it is in some regards because your average Wall World Series game often is not going to see anywhere near the ratings of even an average primetime NFL game. That's just how dominant the National Football League has been in terms of broadcast ratings over the past many, many years. And this has gone back to even 2006, the first year they had a Thursday night game. So this drop in ratings, to me, following this for many years, has just been an absolute shock. Patrick, in his story, Felix runs through all the things that might be ailing the NFL, bad officiating, long games, too many games, no stars. Is, is there one thing that you highlight that you think is ailing the NFL? I don't know if it's necessarily too many games. I, I mentioned earlier they've had that 2006 package for 10 years now. They've had Monday night games, they've had Sunday night games, even the London game. But I think the quality of the product on the field has been a challenge. I'm hearing from the millennials that I know that they are turning off NFL games for the first time in their lives. So I think the quality of the product on the field is a real issue. And I think one of the NFL's best products, it's Red Zone Channel, where you're able to watch at the same time several games that are in scoring positions at once. I think it's become, while still a great product, very cannibalistic to existing ratings during uh, in-game uh, shows. Sarah Fryer, one culprit might be the internet, right? The, the NFL is streaming games on Yahoo, on Twitter. Do you think that might be eating into the core audience? I, I actually... Absolutely. Sorry. Yeah, I, I mean, these are companies that are almost betting on the NFL needing another 
way to find audience. Twitter this year had a deal with the NFL to stream 10 Thursday night football games and that's sort of at the cornerstone of their media strategy for the future of Twitter. You know, they want to do that with baseball and hockey and basketball as well. And so Absolutely, I think that these are these are new channels for the NFL to explore that we really don't have great ways to measure yet. I want to play a quick clip from analyst Porter Bibb, who who actually uh, uh, kind of blames Nielsen and its inability to track these some of these new channels. Have a listen. Mobile is not a reliable. There's no Comscore and several other measurement services are not reliable, and advertisers don't believe them. They don't buy the the, the numbers. And, and look, Nielsen's been the industry standard for 50 years, and nobody believes Nielsen. Sarah, can Nielsen do a better job uh, monitoring these online and mobile channels? Absolutely. I mean, Felix mentions in his story that they're already working to try to refine their ratings and, and guess how many people might be watching it at a bar. They absolutely need to do more with the social networks, with the online streaming sites to try to get a better sense of how many people are watching when they're watching and, and what the engagement is like. Twitter, for example, their first Thursday night NFL football game, they told everyone that 2.3 million people watched it. But we don't really know what that means. Do they watch it for the whole time? Do they turn it on for a second? Do they retweet a tweet that was related? I don't know what that 2.3 million means, and I think you know Nielsen would be one of the places to tell us. Patrick, Patrick Keen, are we shooting the messenger here by blaming Nielsen? Um, perhaps, but I, I mean, Nielsen, as that other guest mentioned, has been in this business for 50 years. I mean, I will take slight bit of a devil's advocate to the Twitter being cannibalistic experience for the NFL. I don't really necessarily think it is. I think what's an issue is that there are so many sources to find scores, so many sources to get instant results and to get instant highlights. It could be a, a somewhat of an issue, but I don't think that you'll ever see the NFL surrendering a Sunday night game or a Monday night game. There's a reason they're giving Thursday night game access, and I see it as purely additive, not cannibalistic at all. Patrick, last quick question. Can they, does the NFL learn anything from last night and from this amazing World Series that we just witnessed? Uh, you would hope so. I think that the NFL still is an incredibly powerful sport, but I worry that over time it could go the way of some of the other biggest sports that were pre and post war, which were, uh, if you look at boxing, if you look at horse racing, baseball. I just hope that the NFL doesn't fall the same fate as boxing in the world, but I think that's a big challenge for the league. Okay, and hopefully the Cleveland Indians will get him next year. Thank you guys both. Share through President Patrick Keene and Bloomberg Sarah Fryer. Coming up, Postmates CEO Bastian Lehman joins to discuss a hard-won $141 million fundraising round. We're talking about his on-demand startups next. This is Bloomberg. Turning now to the on-demand delivery space. One company making its mark is Postmates. The San Francisco-based delivery startup recently closed a $141 million funding round. The influx of cash comes despite a slowdown in VC funding. Joining us now, Postmates CEO Bastian Lehman and Bloomberg Technologies own Eric Newcomer. Thank you, guys. Bastian, congratulations on the funding. Thank you. But we were talking about this round for a long time. How difficult was it? Did you, did you bleed a little bit to raise this money? I wouldn't say we bled, but it, you know, I think the, the funding environment definitely cooled down. And uh, on top of that, we're operating in a space that's a little bit um, underappreciated right now. I think the on-demand space in general um, had a little bit of a, of a, of a bearish uh, outlook this year. That 100 uh, or that valuation was the same as your previous valuation. Usually, a kind of sign of investor caution when the valuation doesn't go up. What is, what is, what, what should we take from that? Well, I mean, we would have loved it to be a little higher, but I also believe that um, it is fair to, to uh, look at last year and you probably uh, have a year where the prices were a little bit inflated. So the market corrects itself. I think 140 million is still one of the largest venture rounds raised this year. Um, it is uh, specific, specifically in our space, it's one of the largest. So we're extremely proud of it. Eric, let me put you on the hot seat here with Bastion sitting right here. But you've been in your coverage of this space a little skeptical about the uh, not just the delivery startups, but in particular the, the food startups like Munchery and, and DoorDash. Did Bastion, did, did the Postmates funding round and the 600 million valuation, did that, did that surprise you or what does it say to you? 
Yeah, I mean, it's a super competitive space, and certainly investor sentiment has turned against it somewhat. I mean, uh, Postmates' close competitor, DoorDash, had raised a, a round with a share price that was lower than its previous So that round. was a down round. Right. So, so we'd seen already sort of signs of trouble in the space. But still, I mean, it, there's still a lot of investment going in. I mean, Deliveroo just raised a bunch of money, and then, of course... They're in the UK. Yeah, and then, you know, Uber Eats, Uber's food delivery services... Uh, we don't have exact numbers on how much they're investing, but they're investing very heavily in that and growing that all over the world. I saw some of them in you know, Mexico City when I was there recently. So food space, is, there's still a lot of investment being made, but we definitely seen an increase in sort of skepticism about the space. And, and Bastian, not to go too deeply into inside baseball, but I've read a little bit about uh, how you had to structure the round or a- anything that you had to offer investors to get to that $600 million valuation. Is there anything that you could tell us about uh, getting, getting to the finish line? Hey, I, yeah, I read a lot about it too. So um, <laughs> the um, uh, I think it, it, when we look at the term sheet and when we looked at the um, uh, at the offer that we had from Founders Fund, um, it's it's we believe it's a very fair uh, deal. Um, and uh, as far as I can tell, there is nothing unusual in the structure of this round. Now, Eric, jump in here. But in, in Eric's piece, you talk about Uber, one of your main competitors, and you say they do a kind of a Death Star thing, right? That they weaponize their balance sheet uh, to kind of get into the space with their del- delivery product, Uber Eats. What did you mean by that? How are they using their capital advantage? I think I think they brought something uh, to the valley that we have not seen before, and that is that, uh, you know, you would fight the war with, um, with excellent products and with innovation. But I think um, it's... Um, it has been unusual that you would use your balance sheet as your primary. Isn't that a time-honored Amazon tactic or a retail tactic? Yeah, but I think it, 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 in the blunt way that it's been done, it's probably uh, unique. I thought one of the most interesting things you said uh, in my conversation with you is just the idea that some of the sort of medium-sized, smaller players, at least compared to an Uber and Amazon, could you could imagine teaming up. Like, I mean, what would that world look like? How would that happen? I think when, when, when one says medium or smaller players, I think it's important to say that, uh, look at the total company size. Yeah. I think you know, Postmates fought hard to be the largest on-demand delivery company in the United States, yeah. and we're extremely proud of that. Right. So this, uh, there's a little bit the sentiment that uh, we're just here because an Amazon or an Uber has not thrown everything <laughs> at us that they have. And yeah. that's, that's baloney, right? right. Um, we're here because we, we, we deserve to be here because we've grown extremely fast. Right. But if you want to think beyond uh, the next couple of years, if you want to create a truly large company, uh, you have two ways to do that. One way is to go ahead and compete with Amazon and Uber, and you can try that as a startup. And there there, there are ways to success. Um, But another alternative is that you can find ways to success in creating a large company by by teaming up with other players in that space, international players or other players uh, on a national scale. Well, you talk about Uber using its balance sheet. Amazon, with its new service, Amazon Restaurants, which is a part of Prime now, basically makes delivery free for Prime members. I mean, and they've got to be losing a ton of money on that. So as Amazon now starts to focus on the restaurant space, what does that mean for Postmates? So we have not seen the efforts uh, from from an Amazon. And as far as I'm concerned, we also have not seen or felt any efforts from, from Uber in that space. But despite all this, you know, I think Uber um, and Amazon uh, are interested in their space because it is very lucrative. And, and this brings us a little bit back to uh, a situation that often perplexes me when, when people believe that it's impossible to make any money in that space. It's clearly a space that is very interesting to a lot of players. And we hold a large share in that market. We have a product that is virtually free. If you sign up for our subscription service, you pay $9.99 a month. You get unlimited free deliveries, over $25. It's a very attractive product. Our customers love it. So. Uh, we were very well prepared for the competition ahead, and uh, especially given the fact that we co-created this space. If you think back in 2011, Postmates was one of the first companies that brought on-demand delivery to the mindset of customers. You can be sure that we're not just stepping aside because competition heats up a little bit. I think I mean, one of the things that I think most people think about when they think about Postmates is you can get anything. Like it's any type of food you want and maybe someday sort of anything you want, period. But at the same time, I think to make the business model work, you've acknowledged that you've got to fo- or at least you have to have a, some restaurants that are cheaper and then the everything set of restaurants is going to be much more expensive. Or Am I getting that right? Or how do you think about those two categories? The, the, the truth is that we're executing against the same plan that we did 
from when we started the company. Uh, we wrote it down uh, in all details and, and we actually openly talked about it. We, we launched a premium product first, a premium product that allows the people that can afford it to get access to goods that they want in a short period of time. That product financed other products. The latest iteration of that is our plus product, which integrates merchants, where we receive a kickback from these merchants. And on top of that, we have a subscription service. So it's not like Tesla, but it is a lot like Tesla's plan to start in a premium segment and then to bring the price down significantly. And we have done that. We have about 10 seconds left. Your first international market, is it going to be London, or are you starting to rethink that? Um, we're still thinking about it. You don't want to make some news here? <laughs> I, I tried it before, and, and, and <laughs> I don't want to be off uh, with the prediction. Yet. Okay, well, congratulations on the funding. Bastian Lehman from Postmates, founder and CEO, and Bloomberg's Eric Newcomer. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Tomorrow on Bloomberg Television and Bloomberg Radio, join us for full coverage and analysis of the latest U.S. jobs report. Janus Capital's Bill Gross ta joins Tom Keen at 8.30 a.m. in New York. Coming up, Chinese internet giant Baidu just formed a new alliance with major telecommunications company. More on that story next. This is Bloomberg. Chinese wireless carrier Unicom and web services company Baidu are teaming up. With the blessing of the Chinese government, the two will partner on mobile internet, artificial intelligence, and other areas amid plans for ownership reform of state-owned enterprises. Joining us now, Bloomberg reporter Peter Elstrom from Tokyo and Gordon Chang, author, lawyer, and close China tracker. Chang lived and worked in China for almost two decades. So Gordon, I'll get to you in a minute, but Peter, you've covered these two companies, China Unicom and Baidu, for a long time. What, what does this alliance mean to you? Uh, well, it's an important step for both companies at this point. The Chinese government has been looking for ways to improve the efficiency of the state-owned enterprises uh, throughout the economy. That's from the oil companies, the railroad companies, and the telecom companies. The telecom sector is really uh, dominated by these three uh, companies. And with China Unicom in particular, they want to be able to increase the efficiency of some of these operations. They're hoping that Baidu can bring some of the private sector uh, innovation and efficiency to the, to the state-owned uh, company. Now, Gordon, that's going to be an unusual idea for a lot of our viewers. What, what does the Chinese government, why, why do they have anything to do with the partnership of, of these two companies? Why would they have any interest in seeing a China Unicom and a Baidu get together on these, on these areas? Well, Premier Li Keqiang about a year ago announced his Internet Plus strategy. And the idea was that the Internet was going to revitalize Chinese industry, including state-owned enterprises. And so, therefore, you know, they are looking at uh, the stodgy telecom companies, Unicom, China Telecom, and they were thinking of merging the two of them together, but they realized that wasn't going to do any good. So they thought, well, why don't we spice up one of them with Baidu? Now, for Baidu, this makes sense in the, in the sense that you put, uh, for instance, Baidu's search function on the 3G handsets of Unicom. But if you're talking about mixed ownership, I don't think this does Baidu any good because they're buying into a company with very low growth potential. Well, what does it do for Baidu, if anything? I mean, they already have some of these distribution agreements with the large mobile carriers in China for their technology. Yeah, I don't think it does very much, because you also got to remember that Baidu has a partnership with China Telecom. That was from last May. And so you have, you know, Baidu able to really put its products onto um, the telecom services. Um, so I don't know what this does for Baidu. I know what it does for Unicom, because when they announced on October 22nd that, uh, you know, they were thinking of this mixed ownership scheme uh, and participating in it, um, China Unicom stock really soared in Hong Kong. But for Baidu, do, it doesn't do them any good at all. I think it just weighs them down. Now, Baidu's a company in trouble. They had a very bad quarter in the sense of the first quarterly drop in revenue since 2005 when they went public. But nonetheless, you know, I just don't see how this would help. Peter, our, our colleague Tim Culpin wrote an interesting gadfly column today about the union. I described it almost as a romance and talked about the possible offspring of Unicom and Baidu. What, what did you think of that analysis? And, and is this akin to a kind of a, a merger or a union? Well, I think it's the beginning of a potential romance to, to stick with uh, Tim's potential analogy here. Uh, the two companies are trying each other out. This is a... Uh, um, 
a relatively low investment form of cooperation between the two companies at this point. I mean, as, as mentioned before, Baidu is struggling here. Baidu has fallen behind the other leading internet players uh, in China, Alibaba and Tencent uh, in particular. They've tried a number of different strategies, including this uh, online to offline strategy. They've been investing in artificial intelligence. And this is an experiment. Perhaps the romance goes someplace, perhaps it doesn't. Gordon, I'll let you have the last word. If this is a mani manifestation of this reform effort, what, what might come next? Will, will we see similar partnerships with other companies? You know, we've seen Xi Jinping during his rule of four years combine already large state enterprises back into formal monopolies. We're starting to see combinations here, perhaps with Unicom and Baidu. This isn't going to help. You know, the Japanese tried doing this in the 1980s, and everyone liked it at the time, this sort of convoy system. Um, but ultimately, it didn't work out. And I don't think it's going to work out for China either, because what plagued the Japanese is going to plague the Chinese as well. OK, we'll have to leave it there. Author Gordon Chang and Peter Elstrom, Bloomberg Managing Director for Asia Technology, thank you for joining us. And that does it for this edition of Bloomberg Technology. Remember, all episodes of Bloomberg Technology are now live streaming on Twitter. Check us out at, at Bloomberg Tech TV weekdays at 6 p.m. in New York, 3 p.m. in San Francisco. That's all for now. This is Bloomberg.